Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ben Kieser with Applied Flow Technology, and I want to thank all of you for listening in on today's webinar. It's great to have you, and hope that everyone's having a good week. Today, we're going to be talking about Water Hammer, and before I get into that, I want to make a very important announcement that AFT Impulse version 8 is now officially released. It is available on our website for download, containing all of our new powerful features that we included into the latest version, and we're really excited about it. And so if you go to uh, the products menu, followed by AFT Impulse, then you can uh, scroll down to look at the uh, latest release, and this is where you will be able to download the latest release of the software as you can see impulse 8 it has been released this week now these big red words mean that you do need to be logged in to our website in order to download the software well simply click on the login button in the upper part of our website and when you click on login if you don't have one yet anybody can register with our website and that way you can download the software. And so simply click on register now, and that's where you can fill out the form to be able to get into our uh, website and get up and running with Impulse version eight. Uh, we will be sending out what your license numbers are for Impulse eight, because the license numbers are different than Impulse seven. If you don't have those license numbers, then you can contact us and provide us your Impulse 7 license number, and then we'll be able to get you your Impulse 8 license number with that information. All right, so be sure to check that out. If you go to the support drop down and then under support upgrade and maintenance, this is where you can scroll down and find a full list of the new features. This compares the key new features between the last three versions of Impulse. And then you can see all of the new features that are specific to Impulse 8 right in this list here. So be sure to check that out. It's got some really amazing new capabilities that you'll really enjoy working with. All right, so in today's webinar, I was actually going to be originally co-hosting it and uh, they were uh, not able to uh, do the webinar today with other projects going on. And so I was happy to help with taking over the webinar. And so I was uh, working off a idea to discuss water hammer situations. Is it a component issue or a system issue? And with trying to, you know, they didn't have any content uh, prepared, and I had asked them early on uh, what they were going to talk about. Uh, this was what I was able to come up with, and I'm going to take you all down a deep rabbit hole of what a water hammer analysis would look like. And oftentimes, you might have situations where there's a, a horrible surge problem going on in the system and you simply try to make uh that problem you know go away and oftentimes it's you know just fixing that particular component that breaks well the issue is is that the water hammer waves will pass through your entire system really really fast and so when you see water hammer and surge issues going on it's not going to appear only at the device that you might seem to have problems with. It's going on everywhere in your system. And so this is an example I wanted to demonstrate to help illustrate that. But before we get into this, I want to play a video that I've shown before. I'm going to show again that does a really good job at illustrating how potentially disastrous the water hammer impact can be. So let me go ahead and pull up that video here.
Get ready for it. Here's one of my favorite parts. <laughs> Who wants to stand next to that? Certainly not me. And so that's just a, a really good video that we always show in our impulse training seminars to demonstrate how potentially damaging water hammer and surge issues can be. And uh, water hammer is very much a black art. It is typically not something that is usually well understood. The majority of time, literature only talks about water hammer in terms of a valve closure. They don't really get into what happens when it's a piping network and how it impacts other things in the system and uh you know it's just uh it's something that is kind of a, a niche thing and so the beauty of using aft impulse to evaluate water hammer is that impulse provides you a tool where you can become a better water hammer analyst without having to have a phd in the subject but there is a lot to learn. And with the graphing capabilities of AFT Impulse, that'll make it a lot easier for you to be able to understand your results of what's going on. So this is the particular system that I'm going to demonstrate for you today. This actually is a model that comes from our AFT Fathom examples. And so if you happen to have access to AFT Fathom, and you were to dive into the examples help file, the example that I am using comes from our cost calculation example right here. So as you can see, it's very similar. I've slightly modified the model before bringing it into AFT Impulse. And so what we have here is a cooling tower system where we have cooling water that starts off in the basin and then it circulates through two uh identical but completely separated trains uh as you can see here they are connected with these crossover ties however these valves are typically closed and so the two systems are typically going to be completely isolated from each other. So in today's example, both systems are going to run simultaneously with each other side by side, but I'm gonna focus mainly on the bottom system down here, which then circulates up to the top over on these risers right here on the left-hand side for cooling tower number one. And so as I was going through and I was working on the model here, I started doing some different water hammer tests. And what I started off with doing was the simple classic valve closure example. And so in that example, I inserted a couple of valves here and I figured out what a appropriate CV value would be, 82,000. and I'm doing a transient where I'm closing the valve in 20 seconds. And it's just closing linearly from 82,000 down to zero over a linear path, which you can see right here. And I wanted to determine what are the pressures in the system. Uh, the thing is, 
you are going to have a very high pressure at each of these valves, but that surge wave is going to propagate all throughout the system. So not only will I see really high pressures at the valves, I could also see really high pressures in other areas in the system as well, including on the downstream end. And I wanted to evaluate what was going on with that. Uh, I have some check valves on the discharge of each of these pumps. And these check valves are going to open and close instantaneously because I'm just doing a simple check valve model. I'm not trying to do any sort of force balance where the disc will be able to close uh, based upon the, the pressure across that check valve. Once these uh, pieces of criteria are met, for velocity and pressure, that's what's gonna cause the valve to open and close. And when it opens, it's gonna pop to its fully open position of uh, 7,500. So this is a kind of a worst case uh, check valve scenario where it's gonna open and close, uh, slam shut really, really fast, which is not realistic. It's gonna take some amount of time for your check valves to open and close, even if it's a quarter of a second it's not going to be truly instantaneous a few other things that i'm doing here uh i'm modeling the simulation for 30 seconds and uh and so uh, i've already ran all these scenarios and so this is the first one that i'm going to look at is the valve closure when that valve slams shut what happens so I've already ran the scenario for all of, or I've already ran the model for all these scenarios because they take about a minute or two to run. And so this saves me some time. So I'm just gonna cut straight to the output. In this valve closure scenario, this is probably the first thing that you would look at is the output table. And as you notice, there are several warning messages. And let's just go ahead and walk through these to understand what's going on here. Let's take a look at the first sets of warnings here. It's telling me that my pumps are using a standard pump curve and each of them encounters reverse flow. Well, when you have reverse flow through a pump, what's the pump head going to be? Well, the answer is, if you are using a standard pump curve, you're not gonna know what the actual pump head is going to be. So AFT impulse is going to approximate by using the shutoff head in that particular case. And so when we take a look at one of our pump curves here, if I open up my pump, here's my pump curve. And when you have flow rates that are less than zero and they go negative, what's the pump head? Well, we don't know. So what we're going to do is we're going to impose a fixed pump head of the shutoff value, which is about 80 feet. That's the shutoff head for these particular pumps. How can I confirm that? Well, if I right click on any of these pumps, I can generate a transient junction graph and I can plot the head rise. So when I look at the head rise across the pump, when we have our valve closing right here at 20 seconds, with nothing else going on in the system, this pump is going to eventually deadhead against a closed valve and that's exactly what it's going to do. As you can see, it flatlines at the shutoff head and that's going to be where it operates for the rest of the simulation. And the problem is that this might not be accurate. It may not be correctly representing what the actual head would be if your pump experiences reverse flow and spins backwards. So this is a approximation only. That's where you might wanna use a four quadrant data set to get a better approximation of the pump head in that case. 
we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So let's go back to the output window here and let's take a look at uh, the next set of warnings, which are simply caution messages. This is just telling me that the transient data did not extend the stop time for the valve junctions. All that means is that on the transient data tab for my valve closure, I only specify data out to 20 seconds, but I'm running my simulation for 30 seconds. So the question is, after this valve gets to be at a closed CV, what happens for the rest of the 10 seconds of the simulation? Well, what Impulse is going to do is it's just going to take your final data point and it's going to use that as the same data point for all of the remaining simulations. So that's not a warning to be concerned about. It's just giving you a piece of information and this is, uh, this is perfectly acceptable. That's okay. And so you don't have to worry about specifying additional transient data, but you can if you want to. To be clear, you could enter a third data point to very clearly show that at 30 seconds, I've got the same valve closure data point. So that is an option that you can do. Now, the next warning messages are a lot more important to pay attention to because these are telling you that you have vapor volumes in your pipes. The first set of warnings is uh, just at the warning level. What it's telling you is that the amount of vapor volume that you have in certain computation sections are between 10 and 100% of the liquid computing volume. And so a rule of thumb is that when the vapor volume gets to be more than about 10% of the section volume, that is more of a threshold on where when that vapor bubble collapses, where the pressure spikes that result are going to be more reliable. The more vapor volume that you have occupying the pipes, then the less reliable the results might be because you're getting much more into a two-phase flow phenomenon, which AFT Impulse, the mathematical equations are not designed to model. So the top message is just giving you a warning telling you that these pipes are above that threshold. They are above 10%, but they are not as large as the actual section volume itself. The below warnings are much more critical. <laughs> that's why they're called critical warnings. And that's because the vapor volumes are actually going to be larger than 100% of the liquid volume. So let me change colors here really quick. Let's say that you have a pipe and you know this is a really long pipe. When impulse does the method of characteristics, it has to break the pipe into sections to do your transient analysis. And so from the border of one computation station to another computation station, this is called a section, and this has a finite amount of volume. So you've got your uh, pi d, uh, you know, it's your uh, volume of a cylinder of one section, and that's the length of a single section of pipe. And what this message is telling you is that you have vapor volume that has grown to become larger than the section volume itself, which is impossible, but the mathematical equations can allow that. And so this is a severe message telling you that you have an a, a incredible amount of vapor building up inside of these pipes. So that's definitely something that you'd want to look at further as you continue to evaluate your results. <coughs> The next thing that you might want to look at is what your maximum and minimum pressures are. And this table is sortable. So if you right click, I can sort in, let's do descending order. That way we see our highest pressures first. So our highest pressures are over, fifth, or over 500 PSIA. Now, where are these pressures occurring? 
they're happening in pipes 211 and 212, 111 and 112. Where is that? Well, if I go back to the workspace and I do Control F on my keyboard, I look for uh, 211, which is this particular pipe right here. And here's 212. And here's pipe 111 and 112. So let's take a look at what's going on in those pipes. That would be a good starting point to begin analyzing my results. So it's telling me that I've got 515 PSIA. Well, I'm going to select these two pipes right here on the workspace. I'm going to right click on the workspace and say, generate a transient pipe graph. What does the pressure look like at the inlet and outlet for each of those pipes? And so here, we can see in the first 20 seconds, there's not much going on. And the reason why is because the valve closure, uh, all of that water hammer phenomenon that happens doesn't really happen until that valve is closed. But this is on the downstream side of the valve. So the downstream side of the valve is going to see a different phenomenon than the upstream side of the valve. So here, what this is telling me is that if I look between 25 and 30 seconds, I have some really high pressures here. So let's zoom in on that area. If I was to click on this button right here in the toolbar, that's my range finder. It's a really useful tool where you can click and drag and you can zoom in to different parts of your model. So let's look at between, you know, about 20 you know, uh, 25 and 27 seconds. And so as we can see here, we have some really high pressures. And uh, after that occurs with these really high pressure spikes, then we have really low pressures occurring. Well, here's the question. What is causing this really large pressure spike uh, out of nowhere? Why does that happen? Well, this is where you cannot simply look at the maximum and minimum values and be done with your analysis. That's one of the issues is that a lot of times when, when uh, engineers are having to do a water hammer analysis, all they typically will do is they'll use the Joukowsky equation, delta P equals rho times the wave speed times the change in velocity to calculate what that maximum pressure surge is going to be and they're done well that's bad because that does not give you the entire story of what's really going to happen in your system there's more to it you've got to dig deeper if you have cavitation going on you can potentially have higher pressure spikes than what this equation will predict. This can also be uh, if you have line packs. So if you're deadheading against a closed valve, your pressure can increase over time. Uh, and that's a line pack situation where your pressure can be higher, again, than what the Joukowsky equation will tell you. So you got to look at this deeper. So here's what's going on is I'm closing these two valves and I want to see what's going to happen in the downstream part of the system. And so something is causing a really high pressure right here. What is causing that? Well, let's take a look at what's happening at the valve first. So when I take a look at the valve, I'm going to right click on this and I'm going to say generate a transient pipe graph for the pressure. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to use my range finder again, and I'm going to zoom in to about 19 seconds here. And what we see on the upstream side is the red. So let me turn off the blue real quick so this is what you're going to be able to expect to see on the upstream side of the valve as that valve is closing 
here's the interesting thing. I closed that valve over 20 seconds. You know, that could be a long time. But here's the problem. This valve, nothing really happens until the last second or two of valve closure. So even though the valve may only be five, maybe 10% open at that particular situation, nothing, ha you're, you're still getting the same amount of flow and pressure through that valve. So that's why this spikes so high is because even though you're closing the valve really slowly, you still have a really large spike because nothing happens until the very end of that closure. And you can see how that pressure wave oscillates at the valve. And this looks a lot more interesting because you have some flow splits in your system and that's going to cause some really uh, complicated constructive and destructive wave interference patterns that you're gonna see. So that's what's going on on the upstream side of the valve. How about the downstream side of the valve? Well, let's switch our graphs. So on the downstream side of the valve, let me expand out to 100% again. What we see is as the valve closes, we immediately drop to vapor pressure. How do I know it's vapor pressure? Well, one way is if I check the system properties window, my vapor pressure is 0.85 PSIA. If you click on the crosshair tool right here, this turns on the crosshair where you can actually go to a data point and you can see what the pressure is, 0.85 PSIA. So I'm at vapor pressure. I am cavitating during this whole period of time for about six seconds, which is a really long time when you're talking about water hammer. And then all of a sudden, we have this really large pressure spike. Wow, that is really big. It gets up to over 400 PSIA. That's a, a really large spike. That's going to cause high pressure spikes in the downstream part of the system because once this pressure spikes up, it's going to propagate down to the rest of the system. Well, What's going on here? How can I see that that's actually a spike due to cavitation? Well, let's open our graph list or our graph control window up. And right now I'm only plotting the pressure. Let's go ahead and add another parameter on there. So I'm going to add another parameter and I'm gonna look at vapor volume. And then I'm also gonna look at flow. I'm gonna look at volumetric flow rate. So one thing that you're gonna see for sure is that when you are doing water hammer analysis, graphing is essential to being able to understand what's really going on in your system. And so, I have three graphs. I have pressure on the top, vapor volume, and volumetric flow rate. And I'm going to turn off the upstream side of the valve, uh, which I'm gonna actually just remove that. That's better. Okay, so when we see the pressure drop to vapor pressure, what we should see is a vapor volume that begins to form during that same period of time. And it does. You can see right at that same exact time that I start to hit vapor pressure, my vapor volume begins to grow. And then once the vapor volume starts to collapse and it collapses all the way and hits zero vapor volume, that is like a balloon popping inside of my pipe that's going to cause a really large pressure spike which if you look at the timing it does that's a really large pressure spike that you see all of a sudden and uh and so those two things correlate with each other when you see the uh vapor volume grow you're at vapor pressure and then when you see vapor volume go back to zero 
think of the balloon popping inside of your pipe. And that's what's going to send a really large spike going way up. You can also look at the flow where over time as that valve closes, not much flow changes until that valve is closed. Now look at this part right here. This portion is positive flow. So your flow is still traveling down your pipe. <coughs> if this is a pipe right here, your flow is still traveling down your pipe, but then you get to a point where you're at zero and then you start to have reverse flow. That's what's causing this vapor volume to start shrinking again. So once you begin to have reverse flow, then you're going to have that vapor volume shrink, and that's when it collapses on itself. Now, here's the thing. What's really going on here? You know, this is where you really have to dig in deep to understand the phenomenon of what's going on with water hammer. The fluid is traveling down the return piping after that valve is closed and it's exiting out of these spray nozzles. All of the elevations for all of my junctions in the system are at zero feet, except for my spray nozzles. My spray nozzles are all at a 25 foot elevation. And so you can see that these are at zero. So when that fluid is trying to leave the system, it's flowing across the horizontal piping, but then it has to go up and out to get to my spray nozzle here. So the thing is, this spray, it's discharging into atmospheric pressure. If we open up that window, we can see that I'm discharging into ambient conditions, which is atmospheric pressure. So what I want to do is I want to plot the flow rate through one of those spray nozzles. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to click on generate transient junction graph. I'm going to generate the volumetric outflow. So here you see that you've got flow out of that spray nozzle until that valve closes and then your system is going to continue to drain. So it takes a few seconds until your spray nozzle has drained. And at that point, all of the flow has left the spray nozzle. But then you have this negative flow, which means that you would have reverse flow. What in the world does that mean? Well, this is where you have to understand the difference between mathematical modeling and reality because mathematically, in order to get a flow solution, we have to be able to calculate the material and energy and, and momentum balances to ensure that the, the laws of conservation are not violated. <clears throat> so if I was to plot the pressure as well, will it allow me to do pressure? No. Um, if I was to look at the pressure, it's going to be atmospheric pressure. So let's take a look at the outlet pressure of this pipe that's immediately upstream. I actually definitely did both inlet and outlet. I just want to look at the outlet. So here, we're at atmospheric pressure. So the what this means is that the pressure inside the pipe upstream of this outlet point, which is uh, immediately upstream of where that spray nozzle is located, we have a boundary condition of atmospheric pressure. So that is telling impulse that flow is allowed to enter here, but in reality, that's actually going to be air your system is going to be sucking in air and that air is going to start passing in to the downstream side of the valve closure. And that's not something that impulse is going to model. All right. So impulse is still assuming liquid densities 
inside of the pipes throughout the entire simulation. And this is a very important assumption uh, behind the method of characteristics to understand with impulse is that all pipes are assumed to be liquid full. And so when you take a look at the graph of the flow rate through the spray discharge valve, and you see that it's negative, in impulse world, this is density of water because impulse doesn't know that when you're specifying a boundary condition of atmospheric pressure, it doesn't know that that's air at atmospheric pressure. It doesn't know that. It just knows that it's a fluid at atmospheric pressure in order to fix your discharge boundary condition. And that density is based upon the density in your system properties window, which is water. So the results that you would see should be immediately called into question after this point. So once the flow rate has essentially left the piping system, everything after that time that you see in the results will be uncertain. <coughs> And again, this is all part of the art of doing water hammer analysis, is any mathematical tool that you're using, you have to be able to understand the difference between what the mathematical model is telling you and what's going on in reality. To make this a little bit more clear, I'm going to do an animation. And that animation is going to be from that valve closure to the end of one of the spray nozzles. So when I select that flow path on the workspace and I go back to my graph results window, on the profile tab, as you can see, the boxes are already checked for me. Or you can also click on the button that says workspace and that way it'll check the boxes for what you've selected on the workspace, which it had different boxes at first. So what I'm going to plot is the pressure and I'm going to put vapor volume on here and indent it to the right. That makes it a secondary y-axis. And then I'm going to add flow. All right. So the uh, labels are identifying where I have uh, junctions. And so I'm going to uh, modify my scale a little bit. So here's the thing that I want you to notice is uh, initially the vapor volume is going to be zero. If you see this red line drop to vapor pressure, which is basically really close to zero, you should start to see the vapor volume form at that same location, and you should see it grow. And so that's one of the key ways of evaluating your water hammer results. In terms of flow, what we wanna see is, when does this flow get to be below zero? And that would indicate where your pipes are starting to become completely empty. So I'm going to zoom ahead in time because nothing really happens for the first 18 to 19 seconds. And I'm going to play the animation from this point. So the valve is just about to be completely closed. And as you can see, when I pause this, you can see that the pressure downstream of the valve right here that's going to be a low pressure wave that will pass through the system, which is likely to hit vapor pressure where you would start cavitating. And so as we keep moving forward, you can now see that we are at vapor pressure right here. So you should also see the blue line start to increase where the vapor volume will be growing. <coughs> So we're going to play this further to see what things look like. 
And as you can see, there's that little blue tick mark where that vapor volume is starting to grow. And you can see how the rest of the system is getting really close to vapor pressure as well. So what this is identifying that's happening is you're gonna start having in reality a liquid separation from the valve. So when this vapor volume is growing, you can see that it's pretty big now. That's about 30 cubic feet of uh, vapor volume inside of that section. Well, if this is a pipe, that means that after the valve right here, this space is going to be empty, E for empty, and you've got vapor volume inside of that, and the flow rate is continuing to flow down the pipe, pulling that very, very large vapor pocket. And then pay attention to the flow because the flow is continuing to drop all throughout the system. And so that flow is discharging out through the spray nozzles, and so that momentum of the fluid is just carrying itself forward. And very soon, we're going to see that that flow drops to zero. But then once the flow goes negative, that's when this vapor volume is going to decrease. And then you're going to see the associated pressure spike. So now look at that. We're below zero. So this means that you have no forward flow in the pipe and because it's negative we act what this actually means is that you have air entering your system so this negative value means that you have reverse flow through your piping but again that's going to be a density of your liquid it's not the density of gas so that is a assumption and approximation that impulse is making where reality is not going to reflect that mathematical model. So when you see that this is just about to collapse right here, and we have that really large pressure spike, this pressure surge wave that you see, that has happened after your liquid has left the system. So when it comes back up to zero, that's because it's thinking that you have liquid that is squishing that bubble. That's what made it pop right here and caused the pressure surge to start passing down the pipe. But we don't have any liquid in the pipes anymore because the pipes are empty. And so this is a upper limit on that pressure surge that you would see. What's the real pressure in real life? Uh, is this realistic? It's hard to say because your pipes are basically empty. Maybe there's a little bit of fluid. Maybe you start having some slug flow moving around in your system. Uh, the trouble is the mathematical calculations, it, it doesn't know. And so this is where you have to separate the math from reality to really understand what's going on. <clears throat> so that's what's going to be happening in the downstream part of my system and you know as long as you understand what's going on when you see those really high pressures those are going to be conservative upper limits because that's assuming liquid densities if you were having pressure surges with air filling the pipes it probably wouldn't be as high due to the compressibility and the low densities of the gas that would be entering that part of the system. So now that we see what's happening in the downstream side of the valve, that's what's gonna go on. So now we can analyze what's gonna happen in the upstream part of the system and focus on that. So in this same valve closure example, here's what's happening. I know that my pumps are going to be deadheading. Another thing I want to point out is with these check valves, we should see if they close. So if we go to the output window on the event messages time tab, we can see here that these check valves close at 20.3 seconds. So at 20.3 seconds, that's when we would expect the velocity for each of these pipes to be 
oops i don't want to do that um we should see the velocity get to be uh zero so let's take a look so i'm going to select a pipe and right click and i'm going to generate a transient graph for um I'm looking for my velocity there. Let's see. What pipe number? 304. So let's look at 304 inlet. And we'll look at pressure and velocity. So here we have it. Velocity is on the bottom. This velocity drops because of the downstream valve that closes. Bam. 20.3 seconds. That's when our velocity hits zero. That check valve slams shut. And that sends a pressure wave oscillation through the system. So this is the same similar valve closure as what we have downstream. So... This is where you have to analyze things carefully. When the valve downstream closes right here, this is going to send a high pressure surge back through the upstream side of the system. And as that flow is trying to go backwards, <coughs> we have our check valves here where when that flow drops to zero and it's trying to reverse through the check valves, they're going to slam shut. That's going to send another pressure wave that then passes this way. And so those wave patterns can interfere with each other. So if we did an animation, we can see exactly what that's going to look like. So I'm going to select the uh, flow path right here. And I'm going to go back to my graph results window and generate another graph. And we'll click on workspace. And we'll go ahead and we'll look at the same thing. Uh, pressure, vapor, volume, and volumetric flow rate. That way we can see if we're going to be cavitating in that part of the system. And so uh, it does show vapor volumes here, but they are very, very small. That's because I'm using the discrete gas cavity model. And if I was to turn on the maximum value for vapor volume, I can see that uh, the maximum value for vapor volume is basically zero. So this tells me that in this part of the system, in that flow path, I don't have any cavitation because it's essentially zero. So I'm going to remove that parameter and I'm just gonna look at pressure and flow. All right, so same thing here, nothing really happens for the first 19 seconds. I'm gonna speed it forward and we'll start it right about here. And so now you can see what's happening in your system because I'm trying to deadhead against a closed valve. So you're gonna see how the pressure surges and then it's going to reflect between this part of the system and this closed valve right here. So we'll just keep marching forward in time. You can see how the flow rate is dropping accordingly. And so there's our spike. So now this is going to start propagating back. Now, watch the flow rate on this end here. When you see that flow rate drop to zero, you're gonna see an associated pressure spike right here. That is indi indicative of when that check valve slams shut. So we're reflecting that wave. And so now this is starting to drop below zero. So watch how that pressure increases down uh, on that upstream side. The key thing is that that check valve, it doesn't open again. The, war the 
event messages told me that that pressure spike only closes and the check valves don't reopen. So here's the interesting phenomenon that's going on is that the high pressure wave due to the closed valve here and the high pressure wave due to the check valve closing here causes really high pressures. So essentially those two significantly high pressures are trapped between those two walls. So this is just one of those things where it's gonna take time for this pressure wave to eventually dampen out due to frictional effects. And this is important to pay attention to because you can see that there's some really, really large swings in pressure. <coughs> and that may not be something that your system can accommodate. You might have pressure sensitive equipment in various areas where I have those process units right here for the low circulation and the uh, condenser, you know, these high pressures could be a real problem for that. And so this is where that wave is just going to keep bouncing back and forth until we let the simulation go to, you know, several minutes to where it starts to calm itself down. Maybe it takes a long time. So that's basically what's happening in the worst case scenario where we do a valve closure. The second scenario that I did was a non-instant check valve closure. So for the non-instant check valve closure, the regular valve downstream here, this still does the linear closure <coughs> in 20 seconds. So I didn't change that yet. So here I replaced these check valves with regular valves by turned on transient logic to operate them like check valves. So if we open up this window here. I have two events. I'm using a dual event cyclic type of transient. So the first event is where this check valve is initially fully open, 7,500 for the CV. And I'm assuming my check valve is going to close eh, within half a second, linearly. And then my criteria says that this transient will happen as long as the velocity right here at the inlet of pipe 304 gets to be less than or equal to zero. If this criteria never occurs, then this transient will never activate. So that's the transient to close the valve. The second event is to reopen the valve based upon a pressure. I just said, uh, if the pressure is greater than or equal to five PSI across the valve itself, reopen the valve in half a second as well. So if we go back to the valve closure example, where I allowed these check valves to close instantly, I can do a transient junction graph for the CV. And as you can see, it just, boom, closes instantly right away. And that's it. It doesn't reopen. When I go to the second scenario, we can see that the phenomenon is quite different. The uh, downstream valve closure, that's going to cause the same types of transient. But here, because I did a smoother opening and closing of that check valve, this is going to reflect reality a little bit more. And the reason why is because my check valve is not closing absolutely instantly. So here I have my initial closure, but then it reopens a little bit and then it closes again. And so there is a little bit of check valve chatter that we're going to see. And that very well could be a real phenomenon. Now, if you wanted to do a more realistic uh, check valve closure, then what you should use is the real check valve junction and use the force balance option. When you choose the force balance option, this allows you to model actual geometry and specifications of the type of check valve that you have. 
Maybe it's a swing check. Maybe it's a translating nozzle or plug. So if you do those two different types, you can get a more realistic behavior of what your check valve is gonna do. But if you don't have that information and you're just trying to do a bit of a sensitivity analysis, then using a regular valve with a dual event cyclic, <coughs> that's where you're gonna get a, uh, a good estimate of how that check valve is gonna perform when you don't have any other data. So what does this do to the pressure at the check valve? Well, if I select that pipe again, and we take a look at the pressure. It just takes a moment to graph because it's got a lot of data. I can actually compare this to the previous scenario. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on that drop down menu and say select scenarios. And let's see what happens between those two scenarios. So we'll regenerate it. So there's a lot going on here. Let's uh, take out the outlet and let's just look at things one at a time. So here's the initial scenario where my check valve slams shut and these pressures get to be really high. If you were to use a more realistic valve closure where it's not closing instantaneously, what you see is the first pressure spike that you get when it closes it gets pretty high and so that is you know not surprising and it's similar to what we saw in the previous scenario but the thing to pay attention to is later on as that valve chatters a little bit more that chatter is going to be less than the chatter that you saw previously and so this is one way that it's going to help dampen out and smooth out those pressure spikes is by allowing the valve to function like a real check valve where it's not opening and closing instantaneously. So we have a little bit of chatter, but we do have some cavitation. I'm not gonna dig too much deeper in this particular scenario. I'm just gonna keep walking through my analysis uh, because I still saw some really high pressures in that system. So the next thing that I decided to try was a 80-20 closure. The 80-20 rule of thumb is where instead of closing the valve linearly over a certain amount of time, you break it up into pieces. So if I'm taking that valve from a fully open CV of 82,000 and I still want to close it in 20 seconds, I'm gonna break it up into two parts. First, I'm gonna close the valve 80% of the way in the first 20% of the time to close the valve. After that, I'm going to close the remaining 20% of the valve over a much longer period of time. This type of a profile does a excellent job at helping dampen out surge pressures that you see in the system. And this is maybe another way that you can try and mitigate that uh, problem that you see. So I'm gonna go ahead and plot the same flow path here. And I'm going to go to my graph results tab. I'm gonna look at my profile plot here. And I'm gonna look at just pressure and uh, vapor volume. But let's go ahead and look at some different scenarios. Let's look at the uh, worst case and the 80-20 closure. I'm not going to show the non-instant check valve closure because that's actually being used in this scenario. So that's using the same uh, non-instantaneous check valve closure. Ah. So this is one thing to pay attention to is if you're doing this multi-scenario graphing, <coughs> in order for that to work, you have to have the same pipes and junctions in each of the scenarios. And so because it's forgetting something, um, 
it's telling me uh, that I don't have a certain valve in that path. Uh, so it's only going to plot one scenario, which is the current scenario. So we'll just make it easier on ourselves and say current scenario only. All right, so if you remember the scale that we saw in the uh, first scenario that we looked at was much, much higher. It was up to 500 PSIA. This is now around 200. So we're going to go ahead and play this out and see what it looks like. So as you can see, we have a little bit of valve closure going on, a little bit of a response in the system, and then we start to have our behavior. And I'll speed that up. So this is when that check valve slams shut, uh, but it's still going to chatter a little bit. And so that's sending a high pressure surge from this end. So the 8020, it fixed this problem. So that pressure surge wasn't as high when that valve closed but this one is. And so this is going to cause more uh, havoc on the rest of the system. So we'll slow this down a little bit more. And what I want you to pay attention to is the vapor volume. This is all vapor pressure down here, and this is all cavitation going on. And so that's what's causing this effect is those vapor bubbles are collapsing. And so if there's a significant amount of cavitation, it's difficult to say how reliable these spikes are, but it gives you a better idea of what the high values and low values are that you might be seeing. Now, the thing is, low pressures can be just as bad as high pressures because you don't want your pipes to collapse. So there are some other surge suppression methods that you can apply to get around that and so i did two other scenarios uh in this scenario instead of allowing the pumps to deadhead i told the pumps to trip i'm not going to demonstrate that scenario because i still had some cavitating uh behavior going on and some high pressure spikes so the last scenario that i did to try and implement a little bit better surge suppression was to apply some gas accumulators. And I put two of them in each part of the system. I put one of them right here and one of them right here. And so, you know, this is a long pipe run. This is a fairly long pipe run, you know, a couple thousand feet total there. And it could be a potentially iterative approach on not only how to size your gas accumulator, but also where you need to actually put it with locating it because that can potentially make things worse. And so impulse can help you with determining where that should be. I'm not gonna get into talking about how to size and locate a gas accumulator. We have an example that can help you with that. If you go to the help menu, show examples and pick your favorite units, here's an example that talks about doing a pump trip scenario with a gas accumulator. So that'll teach you how about how to use that type of component. So here, I just took a guess. I, pre, I am guessing that, you know, we've got a polytropic constant for air and I'm pre-charging the accumulators with uh, 10 cubic feet of air. And I'm just starting off with that as a guess, just to see if that does anything at damping out our surge pressures. And you can take a look at the uh, gas accumulators change in volume and pressure over time. So you can see based upon the change in volume of the gas accumulator that it is absorbing pressure waves. And so that's what's going on for both of those two gas accumulators. Uh, you can also add on the pressure as well, which the pressure is essentially the opposite for each of them. So if I just turn on one of them, when the, uh, you can see how when the volume goes down, the pressure goes up 
and they're opposite of each other. So these accumulators are doing their job of suppressing surge in the system. Let's see what it looks like when we do a profile plot. So if I go to the graph results window, hang with me, this will be the last thing I'm gonna show you today. We'll look at vapor volume and we'll look at flow. All right, so I got pressure, vapor volume and flow. So I'm gonna speed forward to right when that valve is closing. There we go, and we'll press play. We'll speed up the animation a little bit. So here you can watch how that pressure is increasing. Here's one of my accumulators, here's the other accumulator. So you're gonna see the effect on how that pressure wave dances between those parts of the system especially when the check valve closes and the pumps trip. So let me slow this down a little bit now that we see some behavior. So what you see going on is the effect of the pump that has tripped and the check valve that is maybe chattering a little bit. That is causing water hammer between that part of the system and the gas accumulator. but you could see how that gas accumulator is not just letting those significantly and, and potentially massive spikes transmit themselves through the rest of the pipeline. So you can see that there's still a lot of smooth stuff going on right in here, again, because maybe this is the important equipment that you really need to protect. And we still don't see any vapor volumes. And so this is also a way of helping potentially mitigate or eliminate cavitation. <coughs> and so all you would see now is basically this pressure wave go up and down and up and down, but it's gonna be a lot more gentle than we have seen in previous scenarios. And the maximum pressures may not or and minimum pressures also may not get to be too high or too low that will cause issues and because it dampens things out that water hammer phenomenon <coughs> it may dampen itself out much faster than in the other scenarios So to summarize what we looked at today, um, I wanna remind everyone that when you're doing a water hammer analysis, rarely ever is it a component problem. You know, rarely ever is it gonna be just a check valve that's causing an issue. Uh, let me collapse my quick access panel here. If you're seeing a water hammer phenomenon and maybe it's a, a check valve slamming issue look for the look for what's going on in the rest of the system because even though it may be a problem that's happening here you have seen how those pressure waves pass through the rest of the system and it, they do so very very quickly so when we see a really high pressure here even though this flow path is turned off and closed and there's no flow through it, you're still gonna see pressure responses in that dead leg. And that could be a problem as well. And so the moral of the story is when you're doing a water hammer analysis, don't just do a component approach. It's really important to take a system approach to see what's going on overall throughout the entire piping network because there's a whole cause and effect thing going on where one thing happens at a particular device and that causes other parts uh, or other potential failures in other areas as well. And this is an example of what you might do in your particular situation where 
what you know is you have a valve closure. That's your problem. That's the thing that's causing all of the other issues in your system. And start there. Start with the valve closure that you know what's going on. And then try some other things. If you have check valves, try seeing if you can allow the check valves to chatter a little bit less than instantaneously. After you go through that, try a scenario where you change the way that a valve closes. So if this is a emergency failure operation, you don't want that valve to close fast or linearly. So maybe try a different way to close the valve. And that way can help maybe dampen out those surges. <clears throat> it's not a good thing to allow your pumps to deadhead against closed valves. So you might want to consider doing a pump trip as well. And then last but not least, if you need to, try some other surge mitigation methods where you try using other surge equipment like relief valves, vacuum breaker valves, gas accumulators, surge tanks. Each of those have a different function depending on the scenario that you're trying to model and you just keep stepping your way through bit by bit at a time. You don't need to apply all the changes all at once. Make one change, look at your graphs, do your animations, see what's going on with your results and then try the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And so water hammer analysis, that's all part of it. It's a a slow step change through the process to analyze what's going on in the entire system so you can prevent failure. All right, uh, that's basically all that I have for today, everyone. I wanna thank you again for joining me. I hope that you enjoyed the webinar. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. We'll be glad to help. And if you do not have access to a impulse license, or uh, if you have an old version and your SUM is expired and you want to try out the new version, or if you don't have impulse, contact AFT and we'll be happy to set you up with a 10 day evaluation license. With the 10 day evaluation license, you can try out the full version of AFT impulse eight for free and as a bonus we will turn on the add-on modules for you that way you can also try out the settling slurry module and the pulsation frequency analysis module so if you want to uh, give it a shot contact us and we'll be happy to get you set up with that evaluation license thank you very much everyone take care and have a wonderful rest of your week